few years ago, I embarked on a solo excursion in the backcountry of Alaska. It was intended as a long weekend of camping and fishing in various locations, inspired by my family's suggestions. My father, born and raised in a small town outside of Anich, Alaska, had spent his youth hunting and backpacking across the state. Growing up listening to his incredible stories naturally led me to plan my own adventure to experience the wonders he often recounted. The trip was pretty bare bones. As an accomplished outdoorsman, I was aware of the dangers of the Alaskan bush and didn't take it lightly. Rather than venturing deep into isolated territory or hiking off the grid, I chose well-known recreational areas for campers and fishermen, though I took back roads to maintain some distance from others. I remained within a mile or two of the nearest camp. I found a secluded inlet along a river, a spot my dad claimed was excellent for fishing. However, something must have changed over the past 30 years, as I didn't get a single bite on the first day. The area showed signs of through traffic and possibly local riffraff, bottle caps, scraps of plastic, but nothing major. Undeterred, I tracked upstream for a couple of miles to deep pools teeming with fish. Despite changing my fly setup, I still had no luck. It was puzzling, especially when the fish suddenly went into a frenzy, darting in all directions an unusual behavior, contrary to their natural instinct to swim away from perceived threats in a coordinated manner. Attributing it to bad luck, I moved further upstream. The woodland eventually opened up into a rolling meadow where the river branched out. The sun broke through the clouds, warming the chill air. During my time there, I occasionally heard a strange buzzing noise but it was intermittent and I couldn't pinpoint its source. After securing some fish for dinner, I took a leisurely hike, capturing stunning photos of the landscape. However, I didn't encounter anyone except for a fleeting glimpse of someone along the riverbank. Despite my attempts to make contact, they remained hidden. This struck me as odd. Why would someone avoid interaction in such a remote area? Growing uneasy, I quickened my pace back to camp, frequently glancing over my shoulder. My mind raced with plausible explanations. Shadows, branches, or perhaps a small animal. But when I concealed myself near a river bend to survey the trail, I spotted the same figure trailing me discreetly. To my surprise, he appeared paramilitary donning a tactical vest and chest rig. He waved when he noticed me watching, then vanished into the trees. Despite the odd encounter, the rest of my evening was peaceful. I enjoyed a delightful dinner of garlic and butter-stuffed fish under the stars, reflecting on the day's strange and unexpected events. In the midst of it all, I often thought about my father imagining him camping nearby in years past, having similar evenings. It felt special to be repeating the same rituals in the same area as him. As usual, I grew tired early, so I secured my campsite and settled into my tent for the night. My fire roared outside, and my spacious canvas tent was pitched between a couple of trees. Listening to the crackling fire, I drifted off to sleep, Suddenly, I awoke, sensing something was amiss, even with my eyes closed. I noticed a light seeping through my eyelids. My first thought was the man by the river, shining a flashlight into my tent. But when I opened my eyes, I was alone, my tent securely zipped. The fading glow of my fire's coals suggested it was around midnight or 1 a.m. However, there was an additional light source about 15 feet away in the trees, seemingly descending straight from the sky in a solid pillar. 
confused and thinking I might be dreaming. I considered the possibility of aliens, but quickly dismissed it. Then, as suddenly as it appeared, the light vanished, plunging my surroundings into darkness. As a seasoned outdoorsman, I always carried a gun. And on this trip to Alaska, I had a Smith & Wesson 10 Miami for protection against predators. The moment I grabbed it, the sky lit up again, this time directly above my campsite. The column of light was about 20 feet in diameter, a bright, solid white. In a mix of panic and determination, I dressed quickly, armed with my pistol. Peeking out of my tent, the light was blinding, yet my campsite was clearly visible. It was eerily silent, hovering like a phantom. Then, the familiar buzzing sound returned, closer this time. Without hesitation, I darted into the tree line, seeking cover in the thicker woods. Scratches from branches marked my escape, as I aimed for a large, dead oak tree amongst the others. Climbing at least 15 feet up, I watched as the light reappeared above my campsite. From my vantage point, I could see part of my camp and truck, but the light's origin remained hidden in the darkness. Then, the light started to trace my path into the trees before abruptly switching off again. Perched in the tree, gun in hand, I was ready to defend myself. The light reappeared sporadically, once near the base of the hill, then circling the forest, buzzing past the oak tree I was in. I hoped my elevated position would keep me hidden. The night was long, punctuated by the intermittent light and the sound of someone echoing my earlier call of hello in a taunting manner. By dawn, having seen nor heard anything for an hour, I descended and returned to my camp, diving into my sleeping roll, exhausted and cold. I later learned from a neighboring camp that they too had heard the buzzing, but saw no light. Upon returning home, my father was as perplexed as I was, suggesting a military operation, but that seemed unlikely. Years later, a conversation with another camper revealed a similar experience. He learned from forest rangers that local law enforcement used drones at night to locate illegal growing operations. This seemed to match my experience, though why there would be such a drone in the Alaskan wilderness in the late 90s remained a mystery. As we approached the guard shack at the end of the ice road, around four in the morning, the relentless darkness of the polar night was all around us. Our task at the well site was complete, and we were eager to return to camp finish our shift, and head home. The journey was uneventful until we neared the guard shack. Checking in there was crucial, as it marked our safe return. In this harsh and isolated environment, communication is vital. Any misstep or failure to check in could trigger a search and rescue operation, considering the extreme conditions. As we reached the shack, Something unusual caught our attention. The usual silence of the Alaskan wilderness was broken by an odd, distant humming sound. It was unlike anything we typically encountered. Not the hum of machinery or the usual sounds of wildlife. This was different, more eerie and unsettling. We paused, trying to pinpoint its source, but the sound seemed to come from everywhere and nowhere. Deciding it was best not to linger, we quickly checked in at the shack, confirming our safe passage. The attendant there seemed as perplexed as us about the noise, but hadn't seen anything out of the ordinary. We left the shack with a sense of unease, the humming still echoing in our ears. The rest of our trip back to camp was tense, with each of us lost in our thoughts about the strange sound. It was a relief to finally see the lights of the camp, a beacon of normalcy 
in the vast, dark wilderness. Back at camp, we shared our experience with other workers, but no one had a plausible explanation. Some joked about it being the spirits of the wilderness, while others shrugged it off as just another unexplainable phenomenon in the vast Alaskan expanse. This experience, though brief, left a lasting impression on me. It was a reminder of how little we know about these remote places, and how quickly a routine job can turn into something mysterious and unnerving. In the land of endless night, we were halfway across the ice road, traveling slowly due to the 25 miles per hour speed limit. Suddenly, in our headlights, we saw a man dressed in jeans, sneakers, and a hoodie walking down the ice road in the wilderness tundra. It was around 4 a.m., with temperatures hovering near minus 20 degrees. It wasn't unusual for the local Inuit to be out hunting, but his attire was completely inappropriate for the extreme weather. Though he appeared warm and dry, strangely, he wasn't Inuit but Caucasian. When I rolled down my window to ask if he needed help, he didn't respond, just kept shuffling forward, his face blank and emotionless. We noticed a peculiar, acidic smell emanating from him. There was something unnerving about him, something that made the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. One of my colleagues in the truck, thinking the man might be in shock, reached out to help him. But as he did, the man spun around, latching onto my colleague's arm with a look of pure rage. As the man screamed at us, filled with hate and anger, I slammed on the gas. The truck spun out on the ice for a second before gaining traction. The man, still holding onto my colleague's arm, ran alongside the truck, trying to pull him out. After a few tense seconds, my colleague broke free and we sped to the guard shack, another 30 miles down the road. At the guard shack, we reported what we'd seen. The guard looked skeptical, thinking it was a prank, but policy required him to check it out. My colleague's arm bore a noticeable bruise in the shape of a hand. We filed a report and headed back to camp in silence, still shaken by the encounter. The next time we passed that guard shack, we asked about the mysterious Mr. Popsicle. The guard told us they found nothing on their search, not even tracks in the snow. He still thought it was a prank, but we knew better. It was just one of many weird stories from my time in the Alaskan. In the land of endless night, we were halfway across the ice road, traveling slowly due to the 25 miles per hour speed limit. Suddenly, in our headlights, we saw a man dressed in jeans, sneakers, and a hoodie walking down the ice road in the wilderness tundra. It was around 4 a.m., with temperatures hovering near minus 20 degrees. It wasn't unusual for the local Inuit to be out hunting, but his attire was completely inappropriate for the extreme weather. Though he appeared warm and dry, strangely, he wasn't Inuit, but Caucasian. When I rolled down my window to ask if he needed help, he didn't respond, just kept shuffling forward, his face blank and emotionless. We noticed a peculiar, acidic smell emanating from him. There was something unnerving about him, something that made the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. One of my colleagues in the truck thinking the man might be in shock, reached out to help him. But as he did, the man spun around, latching onto my colleague's arm with a look of pure rage. As the man screamed at us, filled with hate and anger, I slammed on the gas. The truck spun out on the ice for a second before gaining traction. The man, still holding onto my colleague's arm, ran alongside the truck, trying to pull him out. After a few tense seconds, my colleague broke free, and we sped to the guard shack, another 30 miles down the road. 
at the guard shack, we reported what we'd seen. The guard looked skeptical, thinking it was a prank, but policy required him to check it out. My colleague's arm bore a noticeable bruise in the shape of a hand. We filed a report and headed back to camp in silence, still shaken by the encounter. The next time we passed that guard shack, we asked about the mysterious Mr. Popsicle. The guard told us they found nothing on their search, not even tracks in the snow. He still thought it was a prank, but we knew better. It was just one of many weird stories from my time in the Alaskan tundra. Years ago, a couple of friends and I were squirrel hunting in a creek bottom during a wilderness camping expedition. After the morning hunt, we set up our tents and strung a big tarp between them to protect from the approaching storm. We had two large, old-style bell tents with external poles, and the heavy tarp was supported by cut saplings. As the storm hit, we brewed coffee and cooked something sweet by the fire, roasting four squirrels on a multi-layered spit. We were snug under our tarp, enjoying the storm, equipped with three shotguns for protection. The torrential rain and firelight created a secure atmosphere, deterring any potential predators. Suddenly, amidst the storm, a man appeared under our tarp, holding a rifle. It happened so fast, we didn't even see him approach. This unexpected visitor stood silently, adding another mysterious chapter to our adventures in the wilderness. Our peaceful camping trip took a startling turn one evening. As we sat under our tarp, enjoying the storm, a man suddenly appeared, armed with a rifle. The shock sent us into chaos. I fell out of my chair. One buddy burned his hands in the fire, and another scrambled into his tent. The man, holding his rifle across his chest, tried to calm us, insisting he was just lost. Despite the tension, we realized he was harmless. A daytime hiker who had gotten lost in the storm and followed the smell of our cooking fire to our camp. His wide, almost unnaturally large grin was unsettling, and I found it hard to look at him directly. After the initial scare, we helped the man by driving him to his car, parked near the pipeline, relieved to see him leave our camp. This encounter was another peculiar experience in the Alaskan wilderness, a place where the unexpected seems to be the norm. During a business trip to Juneau, Alaska, I decided to explore some beaches. As I enjoyed the solitude, a truck in the parking lot caught my attention. It performed a series of erratic maneuvers, leaving and returning multiple times, eventually parking with its headlights shining towards me, feeling increasingly uneasy, especially as dusk approached. I decided to hide when the truck stopped near my car. Concealed in the woods, I heard the truck's occupants slam their doors and start down the trail, one of them possibly carrying a rifle or a bat. My instincts screamed danger. I waited until they were far enough away, then hurried to my car. Unnerved by the tinted windows of the truck, I've hiked alone in remote areas before, but this was the first time I felt in real danger. On another occasion, while hunting with my dad and his friends in Southeast Alaska, we encountered wolves. Observing their behavior, we realized they were affecting the local deer population, making hunting difficult. One evening, the alpha wolf came dangerously close to us. Though it seemed aware of our presence, it ignored us. This encounter, along with the wolves' strategic hunting tactics, made it clear why we couldn't find any deer. I also worked as a janitor at the University of Alaska Fairbanks, where many believe the campus is haunted. One night, a new janitor assigned to clean the theater quit abruptly,
claiming to have seen a ghostly figure on stage, despite my own eerie experiences and the stories I'd heard, I continued my work, choosing to ignore the unexplained occurrences as much as possible. Later, I learned that someone had actually hung themselves on that stage, adding a chilling context to the janitor's experience. In the winter of 97, while serving in the National Guard in Alaska, I had yet another unique experience in this extraordinary state. Alaska's vast wilderness and harsh conditions often lead to encounters and situations that are as unpredictable as they are unforgettable. In the winter of 97, our military task force, comprising various branches, was assigned to build a road on a nearby island, Ainid Island. The Marines spent the summer constructing the headquarters, which consisted of plywood huts and the framework for a mess hall. By the end of summer, these huts were basic structures without electricity or running water. Five of us from my unit were called to active duty to live on the island for the winter. Tasked with protecting the camp from potential vandalism by local native youth known to target vacant logging camps. Officially, it was a training mission for budgetary reasons, but it promised to be an adventure. Six months in a remote island's winter, living in a plywood hut. Initially, life on the island was challenging. With a small team and weekend rotations, we struggled with limited resources. For the first few months, we had no real generator or propane, relying on MREs for every meal. The most daunting part was the outhouse. Located a few hundred yards from our camp, the only facility we were allowed to use due to restrictions on relieving ourselves on the sacred ground. As winter progressed and snow accumulated, we received diesel heaters, making our huts cozy, except for the outhouse, unheated and now nearly overflowing with waste. It was a nightmare to use, especially as the bay for the sewage truck had frozen over. One night, as we were settling in, listening to a book on tape, we heard noises outside. This was unusual, as we had encountered little to no wildlife or human activity on the island. Initially, we suspected it might be local kids, but given the desolation and harsh conditions, this seemed unlikely. The idea of local youths tagging or setting fire to our place seemed logical, considering the state of the nearby logging camps we had been shown. These camps had been decimated, and we were warned that our camp would suffer a similar fate if left unprotected. If it was them causing the noises, we thought we were ready, but the truth was, we weren't prepared at all. Despite being armed with M16S, we had no ammunition as our mission was deemed a training exercise. As we got dressed and debated who would investigate with an unloaded rifle, the unsettling sounds approached our door. The breathing was loud and unmistakably non-human. Our PFC, chosen to lead, flatly refused to step outside, and none of us blamed him. We were stuck in a scenario that felt like a blend of Southern comfort meets predator. After sitting in tense silence for about 10 minutes, the huffing and snorting sounds gradually faded away. Gaining some courage, we opened the door to discover large wolf prints in the snow, alarmingly big, like the size of pie plates. Whatever left those prints must have been enormous, the size of a small horse, or at least as big as a dining table acting quickly to potentially ward off a pack of wolves. We started hanging lanterns around the camp's perimeter and turned on the generator for additional lights. The sheer size of the prints had us on high alert. 
thinking that we might need to defend our camp against an unusually large and potentially dangerous animal 